Mountains have always cast their spell upon us. Bleak worlds built of ice and rock, then shaped and carved by time. But in the shadow of their peaks, life clings tenaciously to what seems to us a harsh existence. Over long ages, life has adapted to these worlds on the very edge of creation. And everything that has adapted to life in these mountains, whether it's a plant, a mammal, or a bird, has adapted to the rhythm of the mountains and their seasons. But mountains live to a different time scale, one that's not measured in seasons, but in tens or hundreds of millions of years. And of all the world's mountains, amongst the most famous are the Alps of Europe. But on Earth, there are four mountain ranges called Alps, and they couldn't be more different. No one is quite certain how the word Alp originated. It could mean white or perhaps high, but the first mountains to be named Alps are those which span the continent of Europe. The golden eagle is a bird of the mountains. Here it lives and hunts and dies. Mountains have a lifespan too, these Alps were born in the chaos of a tectonic collision some 35 million years ago, when the continental plate of Africa thrust into that of Europe. These European Alps are still rising, forced upwards by the violent inner forces of the planet. For most of their existence, the mountains have been a wilderness, too extreme for humans to live in. Yet it was humans who took the word out with them as they traversed the globe in exploration. No matter where in the world the mountains are, north or south, east or west, the same forces are still at work. Mountains may be born of titanic forces, but their demise is slow and measured. Over eons, their rocks are gradually worn away by the slow and steady forces of erosion. Where mountains stand mark some of the most active fault lines on the planet. Water is one of the greatest forces at work. The solid rock of the mountains is scarped by great rivers of ice, and as that ice melts, the water that is released also wears away at them. Water flows through the same courses over millions of years, 
seeping into the fissures of the rock, seeking out the weaknesses until the rock is ground down, finally to crumble and be carried away downstream. At the foot of the Alps, where the waters slow and start to flow more gently, lives an animal that few would think of as alpine. It's the European otter, and the male guards his freshwater territory fiercely. The otter is a predator, swiftly coursing through the water to catch its prey of fish or small crustaceans, sometimes even water birds. With webbed feet, the otter has adapted perfectly to an aquatic life, and they can use their long whiskers underwater to sense the movement of their prey. But when frightened by an even larger predator, the otter will retreat, either to its den in the riverbank or back to the alpine stream, if that is the closer refuge. In another alpine stream lives an animal so similar and yet so vastly different to the otter, the duck-billed platypus of Australia, on the other side of the world. This is one of the oldest mammals on Earth, a relic of an early experiment in the evolution of mammals. The platypus too hunts in freshwater streams fed by Alps, but these Australian Alps could not be more different than their namesakes in Europe. There are no longer any great and jagged peaks, just the remnants of the high mountains that were here. Those mountains were formed over 600 million years ago, but have been slowly worn away. For millions of years, the only forces at work here have been wind and rain and the melting snows of winter. The glaciers on the mountain tops never carved deeply into the land. These are the oldest of the four Alps, and for tens of millions of years, they've remained isolated from the rest of the world. And it was that isolation which has given Australia its unique cargo of plants and animals. The short-beaked echidna, like its relative the platypus, is found only in Australia. For the echidna, as it forages for ants hidden beneath the snow, the short and relatively mellow Australian winters are merely an inconvenience. But far to the north, it is very different. Mountain monkeys, yes, these Japanese macaques in the far north of the main island of Honshu are the most northerly primates on Earth apart from humans. They've had to adapt to endure winters which can last for almost half the year and where temperatures can stay below freezing for weeks on end. To conserve body heat, they spend as little time on the ground as possible. Instead, they huddle in the trees and survive by eating whatever they can find. Over hundreds of years, the ancestors of these macaques were gradually forced further and further northwards as territories to the south were occupied. To their north, the sea is a barrier they can never cross, so there is nowhere else to go except here in the beech forests on the lower slopes of the Japanese Alps. It's hard country, and for their survival, the troop rely upon the knowledge of the older females. She has spent her entire life in this one patch of forest and knows it intimately.
she knows where there may be food and the quickest path to take through the deep snowdrifts to get to it. But for some others, the struggle is not so strenuous. Parrots seem somehow out of place in the snow, more suited to the tropics than here in the Australian Alps in winter. Australia's dominant tree is the eucalypt. There are maybe as many as 800 species, and they remain evergreen throughout the year, no matter where they are, even in the snow. Crimson rosellas and currawongs search for seeds, nuts, and insects amid the snow gums. Some of these birds are temporary visitors, moving up and down with the seasons. But some do stay here all year. The rosellas are able to shelter from the freezing cold of the winter nights, fluffing up their feathers and taking refuge in the snow gums. But these parrots have still got to venture out onto the snow as they search for fallen seeds. But somehow, they don't really look at home. But this parrot is very different. The kia, named for its distinctive call, is the only parrot in the world to live not just above the snow line, but also above the tree line. The New Zealand Alps are the youngest of the four Alps, thrust up in the past seven million years. Then, two and a half million years ago, glaciers advanced as an ice age began. It took a grip on these southern islands of New Zealand and forced old species like the kia to adapt to new challenges. And this is a remarkable bird. It's got the intelligence of a monkey, a plump body and a thick covering of feathers to insulate it from the freezing cold. And strangely for a bird, they're good at walking especially on ice. Their feet have inbuilt crampons and they make use of a natural ice pick. While this bird in its winter plumage has thick feathers on its feet to help it up the icy slopes. The high plateau of the European Alps, exposed to biting winds, are an extreme environment, especially in winter. Few birds have adapted to life up here. The ptarmigan, or snow hen, is one that has. In fact, they spend most of their lives above 1,400 meters. They prefer the windswept ridges, as in winter this can keep the snow cover thin and helps as they search for food. Their winter plumage gives them shelter from the elements as well as camouflage from predators. for there were many hungry eyes on the lookout in the Alps. In this unforgiving world, predator and prey adapted together. The chamois and others like it may have been forced to move higher and higher to escape the wolf packs. but not always. These high slopes are cold and barren places. At the limit of the tree line, the few conifers offer little protection to the ibex. A high altitude specialist, very much at home on the steep and treacherous slopes. Most of their time is spent up high. Here they can take advantage of what sunlight there is and are safe from predators.
They survive the winter on lean pickings, digging through the snow and ice for mosses and grasses. The dominant males are mostly solitary until the onset of the rut, which is often brought on by colder temperatures. Then the males will fight with sure-footed precision. Until one gives ground and the fight's over, Rodents are found just about everywhere. These alpine marmots can live as high as 3,000 meters, digging for food through the deepening snow in a last meal before their long winter hibernation. But this animal remains active all through the Australian winter. It's a wombat. Wombats, like kangaroos, are marsupials, and almost two-thirds of the world's marsupials are found only in Australia. These red-necked wallabies in the snows of Australia's south are seasonal breeders, but when conditions are right, marsupials can breed almost at any time. They give birth to a tiny underdeveloped infant which continues to develop in an external pouch. It's like a pregnancy outside the body. It helps the mother to save energy. If conditions get really bad and food scarce, then the mother is able to abandon her young, so at least she will survive to breed again. It's a strategy well suited to a continent where the climate is always variable. Over the millions of years of isolation, the Australian Alps are like no others on Earth. Their low and rounded shapes give perhaps a glimpse into the distant future of what the other Alps may one day become. And the unique platypus, which has lived on for millions of years, can still survive when its freshwater home becomes frigid. For an ancient mammal, it's just a passing inconvenience. But in Japan's north, some macaques have learned to take advantage of the many thermal hot springs that bubble to the surface. This behavior is not natural. It was initiated in the 1960s when one female went into the hot water to retrieve some soybeans thrown by a keeper. Now, these macaques have learned that for a while at least, being in hot water brings moments of bliss from the freezing temperatures that they must endure. For everyone, Mount Fuji is an icon. It's the highest mountain in Japan and is at the southern limit of the Japanese Alps, which lie along one of the most active fault lines on the planet. This strange creature is often only seen in winter. It's a Japanese sero, and in the summer months, they remain hidden in the thickness of the beech forests. The sero is somewhere between a sheep and a goat. Now, they must come to the edge of the forests to scratch for food, behavior that is mirrored by other alpine specialists. Although, in Europe, this chamois has got some digging to do. Little is known about the sero in the wild. Mostly, they are solitary, Perhaps the closest bond is the time that a mother will spend with her calf. But whether in Japan or Europe, winter living is never easy. On the high slopes of the European Alps, the ibex also scrape at the snow for the meagre winter pickings beneath.
When the season changes again, the Japanese Sero will vanish back into the sanctuary of the beech forests. But while the Japanese Sero is solitary, the Ibex are not. Females live in groups and attract the dominant males when the time is right for mating. Enticed by the scent of a female, he tastes the air with receptive organs in his mouth and follows the perfume trail. But not always with success. The Kias can breed in winter too. This pair have bonded for life they know each other and their surroundings well. Good strategy to survive on these frozen alpine slopes. As the courtship dance intensifies, she takes the lead. And, unusual for birds, the actual mating can last for as long as 10 minutes. Up here, amongst the snow-covered grass tussocks and rocks, the Kias are preparing for just one more bitter winter that their kind have known for countless years. After mating, the female builds the nest. The male won't lift a claw to help. They've used this nest before. Kiers can live for up to 30 years, and this knowledge serves them well through their lifetime. The marmots, too, are safe and snug in their den under the snows of Europe's winter. They've put on fat, and now they prepare for the deep sleep of hibernation. They'll be protected from the extremes of the climate above, yet it is a gamble. If the winter is longer than normal, or they've not put on enough body fat, they may wake up too early, and with no food, they will surely die. But the kia has to be active throughout the winter. The male searches for food far from the nest, then brings it back both for his mate and the hatched chicks. As there were no native land mammals nor snakes in New Zealand, many birds nest on the ground, as there were no ground predators to worry about. Eventually, even the harshest of alpine winters must come to an end. The marmot looks out upon a world still covered by snow, but already it is melting. Daily now, the sun is moving higher in the spring sky. A world held in winter starts to thaw. And with the thaw, the forces of erosion continue yet again to work away at the four Alps. At the very end of winter, the trees start to pump sap but gales may still break off branches. These icicles in Japan are not water, but pure maple syrup, and small birds are attracted like children to an ice cream van. In a matter of days, the sun's warmth will melt everything, maple syrup as well as water. The New Zealand cave weta can survive for months locked in an icy tomb. Its blood contains a protein which stops the cells from freezing. And, almost like Lazarus, 
It rises from what looks like a frozen death. European grass frogs, too, have spent their winter in hibernation. Now they start to gather, and the males once again call to the females. Australia's alpine meadows come to life in a profusion of wild flowers, a sure sign of spring no matter where in the world they bloom or blossom. And perhaps there is some truth to the story of the Mad March Hare. As the earth warms, a tiny animal's gamble has paid off. Snug in a bed of leaves, the Japanese dormouse has been in a winter hibernation which can be as long as five months. In its sleep, it breathed only twice an hour. Now, as it warms, its heart rate increases from a resting 50 beats a minute to almost 500. Food is now the only thing on its mind, or the months of hibernation will have been for nothing. And in the Australian alpine spring, the minute mountain pygmy possum also has food on its mind. And food is coming in a spring migration of millions and millions of moths, which fly to the high country to seek shelter from the heat of the day. These bogong moths are a bonus for many, not just the pygmy possum. Wolf spiders are active hunters rather than web weavers. The mountain pygmy possum is the only Australian mammal to be found only above the snow line. It goes into a winter hibernation while other small marsupials must still hunt insects beneath the snow. And like many alpine creatures, it's a specialist now endangered by its specialization. Australia's climate has always been variable and this tiny marsupial faces an uncertain future as the snowfields diminish year by year. Native Australian ravens also feast on the moths. For the European raven, there is a meal of a different type. As the alpine snows melt, the carcasses of animals which have slipped and fallen are revealed. But there's competition. Golden eagles are very territorial. With acute eyesight, they are constantly alert for any sign of intrusion, and that may mean food. This raven knows this could well be the last supper, for a while at least.
These flightless birds, Australian emus, have only one thing on their mind, fighting over a breeding territory. Australia's largest bird of prey, the wedge-tailed eagle, is no threat to them, or to adult eastern grey kangaroos on the grass plains that spread out from the Alps. Female kangaroos can have young at different stages of development. While one is developing in the pouch, she can also be ready to mate. Males constantly seek out these females, and just like the ibex, they follow the scent, luring them to the receptive female. And, like the ibex, large males fight for dominance, and there will only ever be one winner. The Australian Alps border a vast and arid continent where everything has had to adapt to a life where water is a scarce commodity from either rainfall or snowmelt. But in Europe, the snowmelt brings an annual bonus. Rivers flow again with the alpine thaw and the water-smoothed pebbles provide shelter for the plover which hides its nest and eggs amongst them. Just like the Rybill of New Zealand. Both the plover and the Rybill, almost as far apart as any two species could be, find food and shelter along shallow braided rivers which owe their existence to different mountain ranges, both called Alps. While in the Australian Alps, the corroboree frog lives now in only three scattered districts. The striking pattern warns off potential predators. In the same manner that the European fire salamander advertises its presence. Like the frog, its skin can secrete a strong toxin. So rather than trying to remain hidden, they give warning that they are dangerous to eat. It's the male corroboree frog that makes the nest, always in the sphagnum moss, surrounding bogs above the waterline. He calls to the females to lay their eggs. He fertilizes them and they stay until the spring thaw floods the eggs, that then hatch into tadpoles. These frogs need the cold and wet environment of sphagnum bogs to reproduce, but now, they are on the edge of extinction as their alpine habitat shrinks. The platypus too needs water. With ears and eyes shut, the electro senses in its duck-shaped bill let it feel for its prey, often small crustaceans hidden under the riverbed. The female uses her tail to take nesting materials up to her den dug into the riverbank, just like the otters in Europe. But that's where any similarity with the otter ends. For the platypus, even though she's a mammal, lays eggs and then suckles her young with milk. Going down is always easier. In a few Japanese streams is an equally bizarre creature the giant salamander. They are mostly active at night when they hunt for fish. This creature is almost a living fossil. It's hardly altered its shape in the last 30 million years. Cold-blooded and with few predators, they are ideally suited to the chilly waters fed by the melting snows of the Japanese Alps. But for these snow monkeys, summer seems almost to be a nuisance. 
The young were born as soon as the snows melted. And for this baby, only four weeks old, now is the time to learn about her new world. The adults are molting their winter coats, so the constant mutual grooming has an added necessity. It's a race against time. This baby must grow fast to have any chance of surviving the coming winter. But these youngsters have survived their first winter. Now is a time to play. And almost unique amongst birds, young kias also play. They are highly intelligent. As yet, they can't fly, and this play is a chance to exercise their muscles and to train their skills. There are no winners and no losers in this play fight. They test each other's weaknesses and build each other's strengths. For marmots too, play is an important part of growing up. while the young chamois seem overwhelmed by their own movement. But there is a serious side to play. These young male ibex play fight in a rehearsal for combat that will come, when the intent will be serious, when there will be losers and winners. For centuries, the New Zealand Alps have echoed to the plaintive calls of the kia. The mountains here grew in a separate evolution. New Zealand was carved by the glaciers of the last ice age. Its forests of Nothophagus are a reminder of a world that has almost vanished. The kia's brain and beak are its tools for survival. These young have now fledged, and this is a time to learn what can be eaten and what can not. And how best to try and rob a ground-dwelling mutton bird of its egg. For the kia has learnt to be a predator. They remember where the mutton birds nest, and they remember when. It's trial and error, and they are not above a meal of flesh. The kia has learnt to take whatever opportunities come its way and the fat under a chick's skin is valuable to supplement a sometimes lean and uncertain diet of alpine plants and insects. And it's not only the kia which can give the brief flash of a red wing. This bird is another alpine specialist. The European wall creeper nests in rock fissures, which are virtually inaccessible to any other creature. Seeming to defy gravity, the adult hunts along the sheer rock faces for insects to feed both itself and its growing chicks.
Then it falls away, dropping and rising with the winds that are always shifting and changing in its mountain home. And as the cold winds start to gust across the European Alps, they herald another change in the seasons. Just a heartbeat in the tens of millions of years these Alps have witnessed since their birth. In Australia, the first of the winter winds blow from the Antarctic. As they cross the vast southern ocean, they collect moisture, which falls as rain. Australia's native animals have adapted to a climate of variability and they're also gentle on the land. Wallabies and wombats nip the grass rather than pluck it. They have soft feet and when they move, they seldom, if ever, cause erosion. The only forces at work have been those of wind and water. The eucalypts will remain in full leaf throughout the winter. But in the Northern Hemisphere, many trees have a different survival strategy. The larches, even though they are conifers, draw back the nutrients from the needle-like leaves. The broadleaf Japanese beech trees do the same. They sense the change of season by the shortening of daylight hours, as well as the dropping temperature. As their leaves are discarded, the changing colors are a certain indicator of the winter to come. The tiny Japanese dormouse is a silent hunter in the lengthening nights. Insects can be a rich source of protein, sometimes at least. A dormouse may only live for two or three years. Whether it survives for another season will depend on how much weight it gains before the freezing winter days and nights send them into the deep sleep of hibernation. Now is the time to put on as much fat as they can. Japanese squirrels and blue jays too are busy with the autumn harvest. So too are the macaques, now ceaselessly moving through their territory, eating fruits and autumn berries as they go. Even at the best of times, these northern beech forests are a marginal habitat. Once the fruits and berries have gone, there'll be no more until spring six long and bitter winter months away. Marmots, those ever resourceful rodents, prepare for winter too. The chamois males are in their rut as autumn gradually drifts into winter. Their single-minded determination and their agility is astonishing, a behavior born of centuries of adaptation. But only a few thousand years ago, a new force came up into the European Alps, a force which is almost stronger than any season. Humans who for centuries had lived in the shadows of the mountains, moved up with their herds and flocks. With them, they brought a change, a change which is still being felt today. Sheep are valuable, and nothing could be allowed to interfere with the flocks, so there were losers. Wolf packs are almost gone from the Alps. 
so too the brown bear, forced to move into more and more marginal lands. And the lynx. The mountain cat was another to feel the impact of the human intrusion in the high alpine valleys. Recently, however, there has been another change, a change in attitude. Space is now being set aside for wilderness, for predator and prey to live out their lives. Although sometimes it can be a tricky business. For most of the time that we've been on the planet, we have avoided the high mountains, except for sport. Now, we are making them a sanctuary. There were some benefits from human activities. The grazing flocks and herds, which moved up to the alpine pastures, created a new habitat, which benefited many plants and the insects which pollinate them. Many of the higher regions of the Alps cannot be farmed or grazed, so a balance is being struck between the needs of a growing population and the wild animals which had lived in these mountains long before humans and their flocks arrived. But in the Australian Alps, the balance must be different. When European settlers first came, they named these ancient hills after the Alps they knew, and they brought their European animals, sheep, and cattle and horses. These were the first animals in the history of the continent to have hard hooves, and for the first time in their existence, the fragile soils were eroded in different ways. Now, government has decided there can be no balance between the cattlemen and the land they use for summer grazing. In a decision not without passion and controversy, the cattle and the horses are being driven away forever. In the New Zealand Alps, the human presence is also felt, but their coming was to play to the Kia's advantage. Modern New Zealand has ski fields which are justly world famous, and for the ever inquisitive Kia, this was an opportunity too good to miss. There just might be something edible behind the windscreen, and anyway, if not, it's fun just to pick at the rubber ceiling. Or for that matter, anything else which can be stolen. Or which demands attention. New Zealand is renowned for its wool production. Sheep are everywhere, and they were to bring the kia into conflict with the settlers, for there is a dark side to the kia's nature. In severe seasons, it's little wonder that the sheep, grazing what they could of any visible grass, should have been exploited by an intelligent and opportunistic parrot with a taste for fat. The kia is well used to the cold, and they know how to find food in the dark. They are silent as they go about their business. The kia knows it can dig easily into the lower back of the sheep behind the ribs. As it happens, 
that is above the kidneys, which are surrounded by a fatty tissue, apparently much liked by Kias. In earlier days, Kias were shot by the farmers, but now they are protected. Perhaps the Kia learnt to prey upon sheep because it's an alpine bird and lives on the edge of survival. All four of the mountain ranges that we call Alps are being transformed with time. Ice and rock will be worn away with time. And in the far distant future, the mountains that we today call Alps will be shadows only. But the forces of the earth will throw up new mountains, fresh Alps in which perhaps new and as yet unknown species will adapt and survive for millions of years to come.